Thank you all for coming to this uh, IoT crash course. It's a three hour long crash course in which we are gonna uh, explain how to build IoT apps. Now how many of you were here for the NiFi crash course? Okay, a fair amount. The rest of you who were not here, how many of you have the sandbox and everything else set up? Okay, so there are a few of you who don't have it. So this is a very hands-on uh, two hours, two to two and a half hours, because the first 30 minutes I'm gonna explain the problem in the context of a business application. So I encourage you to go to this URL and go through the first section because it explains the instructions on how to download and set up the Hortonworks sandbox. I also believe that Rafael and James and others at the back, they have some USB keys with the Hortonworks sandbox already on it. I think that's the fastest way for you to download and get it running. Because if you're gonna start downloading now, it's gonna take you like 12 hours. So I think that we should try to figure out while I'm giving this initial presentation, okay? All right. So going back to the fact that some of you were already here for the NiFi crash course, the way it is different from that crash course is that it is an extension of that course. So NiFi crash course was very focused on NiFi. It was telling you how to use NiFi to do data ingestion. This is an extension of that crash course in the sense that we're gonna ingest data and then we're gonna store it and do some processing to it to build an application which solves a business need, okay? So this covers the end-to-end -end stack, a typical stack which we see being used when we go into our customers. Um, the stack looks like this. You start with NiFi, push the data to Kafka, then process it using Storm, and on the other side, you also store these events which you are streaming in through NiFi into HDFS for, you know, machine learning and offline data analysis, right? So in this class today, we're gonna have a series of labs which will start from NiFi, then they will go to Kafka, then the things will go into Storm, and also along the way, we will see some snippets of HDFS and HBase processing. Okay, sound good? All right, so, before, so to start things off, I'm gonna give, tell you guys a story. The story is about a, a transportation company which is facing problems with its business, okay? And the business problems it is facing are the same ones which you will be helping that business to solve today, okay, with these labs. So let's uh, dive in. So Mega Corporation. It has a problem that the CEO, Ms. Brady, is worried that they are losing a lot of money in insurance premiums. This transportation company has a very simple business. They have certain trucks which go around in the Midwest, or you can think of any other area on Earth, and they are just transporting goods from one point to another. But the, because of the regulations, they have to satisfy certain insurance uh, uh, standards, right? Um, their insurance premiums, by the way, are skyrocketing. They're skyrocketing because of two reasons. One is that the drivers sometimes, you know, they don't, they don't follow the instructions of the road as they should be. They are tired and they still keep driving. So they are very difficult to monitor driver behavior in real time. That is one of the reasons why they get into accidents or that's a hypothesis, right? Secondly, um, they also have been noticing that a lot of their fleet runs into problems with parts. So a tire pressure goes down, that leads to truck, wearing, uh, truck going off on the side of the road. Or the engine oil goes down too low and you know, the truck starts heating up and you know, it's busted. So Megacorp wants to avoid these issues and they want to lower the insurance cost and they also want to do preventive, preventative maintenance, right? So this is, when I say these things, these are actual problems which our customers have been facing and we have helped to solve them. And when you go back after this class, you'll be equipped with the tools on how to solve them as well. Okay, so Megacorp has this problem. So what Miss Brady does, she hires a business analyst called Tam and asks her, hey Tam, tell me what can we do to lower the insurance cost or just help our business? And Tam estimates that we are paying 3,500 per truck on 5,000 trucks. That's the total number of trucks in this company. If we just reduce the incidents by 10%, it will save overall the company $5 million per year, okay? 
So Tam suggests that we do this, but, but guys, understand that in order, to, in order to have this goal accomplished by Ms. Brady and her team, they want to have a sea change in paradigm. It's a paradigm shift, right? It's not waiting for things to happen, but actually predicting them, right? So it, it involves a huge paradigm shift from being reactive to proactive, to seeing things before they actually occur, almost being oracular, right? Further, Tan poses these following questions. She says, hey, we want to find out what is the relationship between certain factors and the driver behavior, okay? So things like, is there a correlation of driver training to incidents? You might think there is, right? Like if a driver is well-trained, if he or she has more, more and more training, then they are liable to drive better. But we need to investigate that. Uh, does the weather affect our incidents? Uh, is, there a, is there a correlation between driving behavior? Or is there certain types of driving behavior which can tell us ahead of time that there is an accident happening? Okay. So this is the overall theme of the business, and they want to achieve that. Okay. Now, how do they go about doing this? So Megacorp, like a traditional business, has the data spread over different departments. You know, some of the data is present in the business, but some of the the, the questions which Tam proposed in the previous slide cannot be solved by the data which they already have. What are, what are some of those data sets? Like weather, geolocation, right? Because you want to figure out if when a driver veered off the course, what was the weather looking like, right? So they assemble a team of scientists, data scientists, data analysts, Varun, Sue, and Jeff. And these guys, they come back and say, hey, we need some more data to solve our problem, right? So what does Megacorp do in this case? So their data architecture, and this is very, 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 very frequent. The traditional architectures of data, they did not let businesses solve these problems. Why? Because these data sources were fragmented across different departments. You cannot consolidate them into one place. Secondly, the traditional data architectures didn't have the, the, um, the ability to store and process novel types of data streams easily. What do I mean by that? Let's say unstructured data, semi-structured data, XML, JSON, et cetera, you know, clickstream data, data amassed from social websites, things like that. So the current data architecture of the Megacorp, which looks like this, they have a data warehouse, and they probably have some MPP database, um, which is serving out some types of pre-built models to the business analysts. The data silos, they are difficult to find predictive correlations. They cannot handle a lot of data, uh, and also newer data sources cannot be integrated into these silos very quickly or easily. So what we do is we, although this is very homework specific, but this is applicable to all technologies. You can easily slot out HTTP specific components and slot in some other computing frameworks, it doesn't matter. But what the trick over here is that we want to use some technology, we want to use some technology, uh, this doesn't work. Anyway, so we want to use some technology which can allow us to bring new types of data into a new modern types of data warehouse and then do some processing on it. And this will be the overall theme of today's lecture. We're going to see right from the left side how you can use tools of HDF, Hornworks Dataflow, which contains this IoT stack to bring data in. How do you use the tools in that chain to do processing at different intervals? How do you use HDP, which is the green box on the right side, to store data for, uh, for archival and for uh, model building purposes, right? So the, understand that the sweet spot of IoT applications is, in the, is between these two, two boxes. It's the piece which allows you to bring data in, it's a piece which allows you to analyze data, historic data, data mining, et cetera, and the middle part which allows you to take those insights which have been gleaned out of the data stored in a distributed database and put back into a stream processor which is running on the left side in HDF, which is Storm. Yes, sir. Will we get a copy of the slides? Yes, you all will get a copy of the slides. The question was, will we get a copy of the slides? You will all get a copy of it. Okay. So what is the solutions architecture? for this new problem we're trying to solve or the problem of uh, Megacorp. So what the team has come up with is that, hey, first of all, we're gonna equip all the trucks with sensors, right? Right now, the trucks are just going about doing their own business. They have sensors inside them, but they do not relay the data back anywhere. We need to collect that data, right? 
we need to find out if the truck pressure is low, or sorry, the tire pressure is low. We need to find out if the engine oil is leaking. We need to have this telemetry data in real time, correct? Although it is present on the truck, we need to be pushing it back into our main data center. So on the top side, we're gonna, what we're gonna do is we're gonna find out a way to put sensors inside the truck, and secondly, put something on those trucks which sends the data back into the Megacorp's data center, okay? First. Secondly, we're gonna also use, in our data center, a technology which allows us to capture data not only from trucks, but also from um, GIS systems, National Weather Service, why? Because we want to see in real time what are the weather conditions at that particular truck, correct? Then, once we get the data into our data center, we're gonna bring it down into Hortonworks Data Platform, the, t the tools which are present in HDP which allow us to store and analyze the data. So the top portion, the collection and curation of the data is being done by NIFI. That's where NIFI sits. It's right at the ingest layer. It's right at the, your edge of the data center. If you're solving this as a, as a consultant for a business, that's what you'd do. You'd put NIFI right at the edge and it would just suck the data from different sources, okay? Once it has sucked the data in, what you do is you follow it up with Kafka. Why Kafka? Well, Kafka is a message bus that everyone knows, but why are we putting a message bus directly in front of an ingest layer? Actually, let's just hold that thought for a second. Uh, in five minutes, it'll become more clear. But understand for now that we are doing NIFI to Kafka. And then we are taking that stream and we are splitting it into two parts. One goes to HDFS. We store all the raw events as they come in, immutable form. We don't wanna mess with the data as it comes in because you never know how those events will look like, or sorry, what information you might have liked to glean from those events. So we don't want to uh, mess around with the original data format, okay? And the other side goes to Storm for processing. Now once everything is processed, first you put the model back in Storm and you serve it out through a front end. This is a 40,000 foot view. If there's a lot of information, understand that we will keep coming back to this, this type of diagram so you, things will get clearer in the next hour or so. In the end, what happens is this is the end result. Um, they have built this application, which is showing a, a dashboard of the trucks in real time with the dots moving around on this map. By the way, this is not something which we drew out of our hands. You can look at Hadoop Summit videos of last year and also the application which you're gonna be building today. If you finish all three labs, you're gonna end up with something like this, okay? You will actually have trucks moving around on your screen and you can like, move your cursors, cursors on them and you know, they'll show you what the driver's up to in real time, okay? So this is the end result of today's three-part or four-part lab series. The labs are pretty extensive, so if you don't finish them, don't worry. You'll have everything set up on your machines so you can go back and do them yourselves. Okay. Anyway, so this is the application which they have come up with. This will show people, or sorry, the, the analyst inside Megacorp where the trucks are at what the truck is doing in real time. If something has happened already, the truck will show an alert on this dashboard, okay? So did we achieve our goal? What did we start with? We started by saying that it needs a paradigm shift, right? From what to what? Reactive to proactive. Is this reactive or proactive? Like, it's still reactive, correct. Because I'm still looking at the screen and be like, oh great, this truck went away. What do I do? You know? <laughs> so we need more than that, right? So now we need to embed intelligence in this app. Okay? So wouldn't it be nice if you could predict if an event was happening before it was if it about to occur, right? Now think for a second, how would you, how would you make that prediction? Yes, so she says the way we will make that prediction is depending on the behavior of the driver, correct. Yes? Maybe historical events, yes. Good, keep going. We'll come up to an answer if we keep doing this. Real-time event, yes, that's our overarching theme. 
Hey. <laughs> um, what else? Weather and truck conditions, very good. So we have a few different ideas here. Now let's try to converge them. So first, I, first obvious um, um, thing which comes to mind is that there should be some correlation of the previous driver behavior if an event is about to occur. So that means for each event coming in, we need to have information about how that driver has generated events in the past, right? That's one. Second is weather conditions. We need to know that what is the condition of the weather at that instant, right? And third is we need to do it in real time, right? We cannot have the event come in and then do it like 10 minutes later and then tell us that, hey, something is bad to happen. It could have already happened then, right? So the way you achieve this is by hiring a data scientist named Jeff. Jeff is a data scientist. And he says that he has a tremendous statistical algorithm library which he can use to predict these events. Okay, so what Jeff does really, he uses all the points which we have done so far. And what he does, he's like, aha, give me all the events from these trucks which you have amassed in the last four or five years or two or three years. I'm gonna start using R or Spark, Python, scikit-learn, pandas, whatever he knows, okay? He's gonna build a model on it. He will first go inside and he'll try to visually inspect the events and see, oh, maybe the weather, uh, the weather looks like it could be a factor. Mm, no, the weather is not so much a factor. The age of the driver is a factor. No, age is not a factor. So you know what, he first visualizes, sorry, he just analyzes the data visually and he comes up with certain features in his mind that these are some of the factors which could be used to build that model. Because what we are trying to arrive at are a number of factors which can give us in real time an answer, yes or no. Something bad is about to happen or not. So first thing is feature engineering, right? That's what is the first part of any machine learning process. So he'll do that first. Then he'll clean the data. He will come up with a bunch of features, let's say driver age, um, driver age, uh, weather, um, conditions of the road, which is, uh, which is again tied to weather. Um, but he has come up with these features by doing what? Just exploratory data analysis. And what are the tools in HTTP which tell you, give you this ability to do that? Zeppelin, which we just announced in the summit. So Zeppelin is a tool which you will use. I know this is an IoT course, but understand the whole stack. Zeppelin you would use to go and mine these things, uh, do an EDA, and understand the features, okay? And then what you do, you run your rhythm, using Spark, you clean the data, and then use Spark to build a model, okay? And now that model is ready. That model, if you feed it an event, it will tell you whether the driver is gonna do something wrong or not. Okay, the model is now sitting. Now what is a model, by the way? Model can be as simple as a, as a linear equation. It's not something so complex. It's just maybe a linear equation, maybe a n-valued uh, polynomial. You know, there are different types of models. The most advanced are deep learning models, but in the end, all what they do is you give them some data and they'll tell you if, they'll predict if things are gonna go bad or not, right? This is our, this is our, our goal here. So Jeff implements that. How is this being productionized? So Jeff has come up with this model, right? It's a, it's a program which will, it's a command line program which will accept, uh, let's say, um, the driver's latitude and longitude, the position on the road, the driver age, uh, and a few other things, right? And it'll tell you like whether things are gonna go bad or not. How are you gonna put that back in the app? The way you put that back in the app is by putting that little equation in your storm program, right? So from NiFi to Kafka, we got the events in. Storm now connects to Kafka, sucks those events out, and inside storm, as each event is coming in, you're applying that model on each event coming in. And with each event coming in, then it'll generate an alert whether things are gonna go bad, if they are gonna go bad. And that is called what? Real-time predictive analytics. That's it. Or streaming analytics. Yes, sir. Right, the question is, what is the expected response time? So this depends on the business. 
Some businesses require very, very low latency applications. Uh, example of some of those applications would be what high frequency trading applications, right, on Wall Street, right? And those are like less than five milliseconds, even less than that. But then there are some businesses, for instance, fraud detection, as soon as you swipe your credit card, if the banking system wants to have an alert that some suspicious activity is going on, it need not be five seconds, it can be maybe five minutes or so, enough to alert the police. What is the minimum? Okay, so his question is, how, what's the fastest limit we can push to? Good. So, so if you look at the chain, um, NiFi can have a certain number of megabits, megabytes per second. Then Kafka can handle certain limits. And then finally, Storm. Um, because all of these layers, they can be scaled independently in a, in a scale-out manner. Usually, latencies of 20 milliseconds around that are achievable. Because there's another critical factor which we will explain when I talk about more is the lookups. So uh, I'll come back to your second uh, question, but also know that when the event is coming in, I need weather information, right? The sensor is not sending me weather data. It is just sitting on the truck, it is just sending me what? Tire readings and pressures, et cetera, right? It is not sending me weather data. So a very common pattern is what we call um, context enrichment, okay? So what is going on is that a truck is sending me the data and I now have to add more things to it at runtime so that I can feed it into my model, right? Because Jeff came up with a model, but that depends on weather, right? Weather information, whether it's foggy or not. We don't have that info directly coming out of the truck. So at runtime, I need to somehow get that information very, very quickly, apply that, add that, tack that to the event, and then give it to my stream processor for processing, right? That pattern is called context enrichment, okay? And context enrichment is achieved by two ways. Either you have a registry or lookup, you just reach out to some other service, external service, and you download the data from there, which is basically REST call, or you use a fast lookup store. Database might not cut it. A fast lookup store. We want a very simple, easy to use, fast cache, like a cache, where we store the data ahead of time. Let's say uh, HR data. The, the truck is sending me info, but I still want to know how many miles has the guy driven this, this week. I have that in my H CRM system or HR system somewhere. I, I shoot it over into HBase. So that's the role HBase plays in this whole thing. So what HBase does, it allows you to store events, sorry, store data, and it's a very fast lookup store. So at runtime, when the event comes in from Kafka in Storm app, I'm gonna reach out to HBase, pull the data out, make that event, pass it into my, uh, my model, and get that result, okay? But that result, what happens to it? How do, we, how do people see it? The way you will see that in in, uh, in uh, Hortonworks or Hadoop world is by pushing it out to a store which can then serve out um, a dashboard or some web app, okay? Uh, what is the common lingua franca for all dashboards? They love SQL, right? If you can get something in a store which is SQL and if it can give you um, fast access, you can serve a dashboard out of it. So HBase can also serve as a dashboarding layer. It can also serve as a presentation layer. So not only do we use it for fast lookups, but we also push the data back to it, and we access it using a project called Phoenix, which is a SQL-like interface over HBase. HBase is just gets or puts, key value store type semantics, but Phoenix is a project which allows you to do SQL on top of HBase. So your existing tools um, can just connect to HBase via GDBC, okay? So this is a reference architecture. Let's go over it. I um, think this might not be visible at the back, so I apologize for that, but you'll have these slides, so just make a mental map and then I can explain. On the left side, we have the source data, which may be coming out from any system. In this case, these are truck events. What is the first order of business? We give it to NiFi. Okay, so this arrow here, we have streamed into NiFi. 
don't worry about the bottom portion, that's not relevant here. We give it to HDF, which basically, which we are focusing on NiFi there. Then we give it to Kafka, and one, then we fork it out. One line goes to HDFS, and the other line goes into Storm. Okay, again, data, NiFi, Kafka, top portion is Storm, bottom portion is HDFS. So think of the top portion as the speed layer. Everything what's happening here is real time and fast. Everything what is happening in the bottom is batch and slow. Slow in the sense latency wise, but throughput wise it's very fast. In the bottom, we store things in HDFS. We use Spark or Hive or PID to transform the data, to clean the data, to arrive at what? A model, finally. We build a model, which can be nothing but a simple equation, okay? So Spark is used over here not only to clean the data, but also to you know, do EDA, exploratory data analysis on it, using things like Zeppelin. So Zeppelin can, Zeppelin can work as a Spark notebook, right? So from Zeppelin, your data scientists can, can go inside and do EDA. You can use Hive to do data cleaning, all right? Once you are done with your Spark model building process, you store that model in HDFS, let's say. You can store it in HDFS or you can store it on local disk, doesn't matter, okay? Now we are ready to do our predictive analytics, real-time streaming predictive analytics. Inside Storm, we, we make sure that we load the model in runtime, okay? And inside Storm, we also make sure that we are using HBase to add in more info to enrich the event, to do context enrichment. And that's where HBase portion comes in. So we do event context enrichment here, we load the model from here, run it inside Storm, apply the model, and whatever alerts are coming out, we can push them out to first HBase and we can serve out a dashboard on the right, or we can also serve out the alerts directly to a messaging system, say JMS. You can send a mobile phone message. I mean, the world's yours, you can do whatever here, right? But understand the salient points here are that you get the data in, first of all, you store it in a raw, immutable form. You can compress it, and you can remove some of the columns, but don't mess with the data so much, okay? Because today you think that you, you only have three or four factors which your business depends on, but tomorrow you may feel like, oh no, there was more information in that event which I just discarded. So that's a typical problem also. So do not delete too much data from the event stream, try to store as much of it as possible, because HDFS is very cheap. Further, you can compress it and archive it. Yes, sir. Good question. So why, the question is, why do we need NiFi, and why do not we send uh, data directly to Kafka? So the reason is, first of all, NiFi isn't just Kafka, right? NiFi is not a one-to-one -one replacement for Kafka. NiFi is purposefully built for doing integration beyond just simple messaging. So Kafka works in a messaging pattern, right? NiFi can do all standard four integrations, which is remote, uh, sorry, RPCs, uh, shared database, file, file transfers, and messaging. Okay, so it encompasses all four. Secondly, NiFi is very visual. It is built, it is purposely built for having you ingest from various different systems very, very easily. We'll see today in the lab that you'd be able to, today we're gonna be just uh, uh, linking into the standard out of the terminal, but you can go to databases, you can go to Twitter, you can go to any port. Further, you can also have NiFi, and also in this architecture, by the way, which is coming up, but NiFi is actually a, um, NiFi will be sitting in the truck as well. So the way it works is, the trucks will have a NiFi instance, a small guy over there. The sensors will send data to that NiFi. And then that NiFi will talk to our main data center NiFi over internet. If there is no internet connectivity, the NiFi in the truck will just store those events there, patiently waiting for the network connectivity to come back to stream data back. If the trucks do not want to have NiFi, if they want to use MQTT, which is another one of these IoT protocols, they can still use that as well. What do you mean by NiFi? Do you mean like a physical box? 
box. Because Naifa is a sophomore, right? Do you mean like there are physical boxes that can sit in that truck and then another, and then do they like are like each other or something? The question is, what do you mean by Naifa? Is Naifa a physical box which is sitting in the in the in the in the truck? It's a software, right? Yes, it is a software. So what I mean is, the software is running on a piece of hardware in Naifa. In sorry, in in the truck somewhere. Um, NiFi is where has got a very low footprint. It can run on Raspberry Pi, and we are now coming out with MiniFi uh, in a month, which will have an even lower footprint. Uh, so, answer is there. NiFi instance. It's a JVM app, which is running in the truck. Okay. What, I'll I'll take two more questions and then move on because we need to be going. All right. Yes. Why do you need Kafka if you got NiFi? It is because, um, okay, so in case, imagine a scenario in which Kafka, yeah, you can connect directly to Kafka from the truck. If you have the broker list of Kafka, you can connect. Uh, okay, you're asking why is there a Kafka at all? Okay, good, good question. So now I'll explain why. The reason why we want to put Kafka between NiFi and Storm or Spark Streaming is for two reasons. Um, first is, it serves as a buffering layer. So if my ingestion pipeline is very fast, and for some reason my Storm and Spark Streaming app can't keep up, and if I tie them directly to each other, I have to now maintain the impedance mismatch myself. Like I have to put all those controls in into either NiFi end or in my Storm or Spark streaming app end. Okay. So first is to de it's the age old producer consumer problem. So you put a queue in the middle. So Kafka is serving as a message buffer in queue. Okay. Second reason is protocol transformation. We have decoupled these two layers with each other. Right. So now there's a common there's like an interface between these two layers, which is serving as, you know, kind of like mediator. So the input data can be of any format. Today, let's say we are using NiFi. Tomorrow, we don't want to use NiFi. We want to use something else. Then we don't have to rewrite our stream processing end. We don't have to rewrite that. We can just slot, slot it out. So for these two reasons. And it's a good idea to, to, to follow this pattern. Yes, sir. Uh, data is forked in the sense that from Kafka, we are, or it can happen actually from NiFi directly. At some point, you have to send one stream over to the stream real time portion, and the other end has to go into the batch processing or HDFS. So you just make a copy of data. Yeah, exactly. Okay, let's, uh, I'll come back to you in a second. Let's move on so that uh, we get going with the labs, and then some of these questions will get, uh, will get resolved. So one more thing is, uh, I want to show you this one. So this is the physical architecture of if you realize this in practice, this is what it, what it ends up looking like. You see on the left side are these blue guys which are actually trucks. They're going to have a little NiFi instance in them, each one of them, which will talk to our data center or megacorps machines which are running in cloud. Let's say they're running in cloud and not in their own on-prem data center, say Azure. On Azure, you can, you can, you can install NiFi right on the ingest portion, right? So you'll have a NiFi cluster of NiFi. NiFi is also clustered, by the way. So each NiFi instance can handle 50 megabytes a second, normally. According to the hardware recommendations which we gave you, it can do 50 megabytes a second. If you want to increase that ingest rate, no problem. Just keep adding more NiFi boxes so it'll scale out. Okay, that's why I put uh, two boxes there. Then you push it out to Storm and Kafka. Storm and Kafka are co-located because Storm is a CPU-bound normally application and Kafka is a disk-bound process. So what we do, we put both of those guys together on a machine. Okay? And in the, in, the, in the back of those, those boxes are working in tandem are actually the HBase and data nodes, which are really the HBases for fast lookups and data nodes are for historical uh, archival. 
I'll put this slide into our uh, main slide deck, but I just wanted to show that this is the physical deployment architecture. Okay. Right. Okay, so at this point, we have learned how a typical reference architecture looks like. Um, now, I'm going to just very quickly in the next five minutes just wrap this up so that we get on with our lab exercises. But So the pieces, now I'm going to just describe pieces very, very quickly. NIFI looks like the following. Um, for people who have already seen it in the class this morning, but NIFI is a very visual tool. You can drag and drop objects on it, build these data pipelines. So that's another reason why we want to use NIFI, because it's very, very convenient to use. You don't have to write scripts. All these processors for connecting to end systems are already available to you. Just make use of it. Okay. Um, Storm is a stream processor. Again, it's very scalable. Uh, it has a pretty simple API. Uh, you can program it, uh, program it in Java. That's what usually is. Or you can also use some configuration files to build out your flows. There's a concept of a spout, which is the data generator. Bolt is a processor, which processes it. Okay. HBase we covered, it's a horizontal layer for fast lookups. And Phoenix is a SQL skin. And Spark is used for model building. Okay. With that said, let's talk about sizing for a little bit. For, so for sustained throughput of 50 megabytes a second and thousands of events per second, uh, you can use one to two HDF or NIFI nodes, right? And usually eight cores, total eight cores are okay. Um, don't require a lot of memory for NIFI. It's largely, it's, 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 it's not a very memory heavy app normally. Okay. Kafka, again, 10 megabytes per second per node. Uh, Storm is 100,000 events per second per supervisor node. I'll put all this information into the slide so you'll have it. So the reason I'm going through this is just to arrive at the final number. Why? Because I said Megacorp had a problem and we wanted to solve what? Five million, right? We wanted to solve their five million problem. Um, so we are doing some cluster sizing here. As an IoT architect, as IoT developer, you have to think about this. You have to go inside and say, okay, what is my throughput? What is the number of events per second which are being generated by the trucks? How do I go about sizing my cluster? Okay. So problem recap. Remember that there were 5,000 trucks and we needed to save um, just $1,000 per truck to arrive at 5 million annually. Okay. Now, if you look at the sizing of this cluster, what's going to happen is that there is a certain equation of how you size these distributed uh, HDFS nodes, because they not only does HDFS require um, data, but it also generates intermediate data in the process. So we also need to account for that. Also, we can worry about compression. You always want to compress data uh, so you can make use of the space more effectively. But in the end, what is happening is we had 5,000 trucks. And let's say that there were 10 events generated per second per truck. The size of each event was 128 bytes. Okay? So if you do the math, for one year, the total raw sensor data storage requirements are what? 5,000 number of trucks multiplied by 10 events per second per truck by 128. And if you convert it into a year, from the second to a year, it's 200 terabytes. So, and for five years, it comes out to 1.5 petabytes. Okay. Now the question is, because we are designing this cluster for five years, that's typically what the process looks like. For five years, our data volume is going to be 1.5 petabytes. So how many HBase and HDFS and other nodes are needed for that storage? Okay. So that's question one. Secondly, we also have to worry about our real-time ingestion. Like we have to process these in real time, right? So what is the ingest rate we are looking at? We are looking at one event is 128 bytes. There are 5,000 trucks, and there are 10 events per second. That means it comes out to be around 6.4 kilobytes a second. Okay. So how many Kafka, NIFI, and Storm nodes are needed for that? That's the question we have to answer. Also, I said HBase, right? It's a fast lookup store. We don't need to size HBase for storing five years of data because it only stores like last week or two weeks of data at the most, because our application will only require that much, because the rest of it is in historical archive. So for HBase, typically, let's say we want to store 15 days of data. So HBase storage needed is this much, 8.2 terabytes. So we now have numbers. We have 1.5 petabytes for five years, total data volume. We have 6.4 kilobytes a second, which is the ingest rate. 
And we have 8.2 terabytes of HBase storage, which we need to account for. So how do we, what is the money and where, how many nodes are we needed? Storage per server typically is 48 terabyte. So each node in HDP is roughly like 12 terabyte disks. Uh, 48 terabytes and 1.5 petabytes. So 1.5 petabyte by 48 terabytes is equal to 32 nodes. So this would typically be the number per storage, for storage per server. And because 1.5 petabytes is our total data volume for five years, I'm gonna design my cluster with 32 nodes. Similarly, NiFi can collect 50 megabytes per second per node. Kafka can ingest 10 megabytes per second per node. Storm can ingest 100,000 events per second per node. And each HBase region server can store one terabyte. So if you do the whole math, and you can, when you read these slides, it'll become very clear, you need 32 HBase and data nodes, two NiFi nodes, three Storm and Kafka nodes, two client nodes, and five management nodes. So total 44 machines of our cluster. And this is what it'll end up looking like. Right? Note that HBase and data node are co-located. Storm and Kafka are co-located. So we have reduced the cost for the customer here. Okay? There are five master nodes. Five master nodes are because these are required for the management of the cluster. There are master services running. There's a name node one, name node two. They're all in high availability. This is what the service layout looks like. Then there are some specs with the approximate cost for each node. NiFi node specs. So if you do all this, if you do all this, and we come up with a project plan, usually it'll take us like around 120 days from start to finish. Uh, we, this is our team which will be doing this project. And the total project cost is gonna be around 1.8 million. And because we have sized everything correctly, we have built this application out, we know that we will be able to predict events as they come in. Five million was our insurance cost reduction, project cost was 1.8 million. So first year saving itself with 3.1 million. 3 .1 million. So we have recovered the cost right in the first year itself. So this is the business value of these connected data platforms, of IoT. So this is not just you, you, you open Google and there's a lot of buzz, but this is the real deal. Businesses save money. And because of open source, because of, of a commodity hardware, this is not very expensive. Okay? All right. With this said, let's now jump into the labs. In the series of three labs we're going to be doing today, uh, four labs, I think, four-part lab, it's exactly this. The same problem which we did just now, you're going to be building towards that. So please go to this page, if you have not done already. Okay, everyone's got this URL, right? Okay. <laughs> please let me know when all of you have that URL open. Good? Okay. So, we will be following this lab. As you see, it's on the internet, so let me. Okay. We are gonna be building, so by the way, this, this, uh, this problem I described and this, this trucking app, it was an internal Hortonworks app which we used to do demos in front of customers, but we felt like this is a very good education tool itself. So we deconstructed this app into three, four parts uh, as a teaching vehicle. Okay. So this is out on the internet. You can, uh, after you are done over here, uh, you can go back and keep doing this at your own, own, uh, own, uh, own time. Also, secondly, I know that you'll get stuck. Once you go back, you will still get stuck. So what do you do if you get stuck? The best thing to do, really, is search for Hortonworks Community Connection. Okay? And go to that link. This is the stack overflow for Hortonworks, basically. So you'll see in the, in the conference, uh, there's like community center, community booths. All of us are hanging out there. So all the engineers, all the architects, all of us, we hang out in this, in this website. And here you can go and ask questions. 
Your questions will get answered in like five or six minutes. Everyone's like ready to help, okay? So the, the link is, uh, the website is, I'm gonna, All right, so please note this URL down. Okay, all right, now let's start the labs. So the first order of business is to open, I'm gonna give you an overview of what's going on in, this, in these four, uh, four parts. Um, all right, so in the first part, what we're gonna do is, we're gonna simulate these truck events. What's gonna happen is you have some code, we'll ask you to, you'll have to git clone a piece of code in your sandbox. Everything will run in your Hortonworks sandbox. You will clone a git repository which contains all the code, then you'll have instructions to go inside and start executing a piece of code which will generate these trucking events for you. That's it, that's all it does. It's a, it's a simple process which is just generating a bunch of trucking events, nothing fancy. Then we are assuming that these trucking events are coming at us directly from a truck somewhere, or trucks somewhere. There are 25 trucks in the simulator, by the way. Then we're gonna do what? We're gonna build a NIFI flow to collect these events, okay? We're gonna build a NIFI flow to collect these events, and then inside NIFI, we're gonna send them out to Kafka from NIFI. And then once they're sent to Kafka, we're gonna go back on the command line and consume them from a storm application which actually connects to Kafka, okay? So in the Hortonworks sandbox, Kafka is already running, Storm is already running, you'll install NIFI if you have not already. So you'll have everything in that box. So you will generate some events, collect them through NIFI, build that flow out, push them out to Kafka, then analyze them inside Storm, and then again push them out, and there's a web app also in that code which will serve out that dashboard, okay? So if you finish all these three or four uh, graded sections, you should get that dashboard, okay? So that's what's gonna happen. The way we will work in the next two hours is, we're gonna first, I'm gonna first do lab one with you. The, the objective is to get your infrastructure set up, first of all. Um, there's a lot of moving parts, so we wanna make sure that your, your sandbox is set up and you're able to follow instructions and you are able to get over the initial hurdles. Because once you do that, you have the whole environment set up, then it's smooth sailing, really, okay? So let's start with downloading the sandbox, first of all, and just follow this, this, uh, this page, okay? So understand the goals of the tutorial, okay? Then understand the concepts. You, you can skip over these links because you can go back, but um, you can also see how over here it says tutorial Q&A and reporting issues. You can also go to Hornworks community and just press this button, it'll take you to the community uh, portal. Right, see this? It directly takes you there. So, um, okay. Now, let's start with lab one. Actually, lab zero. Okay, first order of business is to prepare our sandbox to make life easy. So, 